Hey, I'm Sith King. And I'm Sonic Sons. We're the Rambling Reviewers, and... What the fuck? <laughs> We've seen weirder, haven't we? I don't know, um... Lizard people trying to populate space with spores. Yeah. That's pretty up there. Yeah, we're looking at April and the Extraordinary World, which I found randomly on Netflix. And saw it first by myself and thought, wow, this is different. It keeps throwing weird curves at you. And I showed it to you and we just watched it together. So here we are. What do you think? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> You know, this, this movie is a lie, by the way. It's not April and the Extraordinary World. It's April and the absolutely shitty world that the lizards fucked up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then had the balls to blame it on us. Um, well, one of them did. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay, so it starts like in the 1860s or something. Yeah, with Napoleon III. And, um... He wants a scientist to make um, gorilla super soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> as in super soldiers who are gorillas. Yeah, with the G O, not uh, you know G U E. Because of course he does. <laughs> Just fucking, of course he does. So he, uh, the scientist in question shows them uh, Napoleon and his one other guy he has with him. <laughs> That he's learned how to uplift creatures. It literally... Making them sapient. Ma giving them the, uh, the intelligence and speech abilities of humans. But, you know, that's not fucking good enough. You know, we just figured <laughs> yeah. out how to make animals into people. But, man, no, 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 no. Let's, let's start sh randomly shooting everything. <laughs> um, and the two lizards escape... Yeah, well, that's that's you, a spoiler, by the way. Uh, the, the the fact that they're lizards is held secret for a lot of the film. Yeah, I, and I didn't expect them to come back at all, so I thought it was a really neat twist when they did come back. They, I, th I called them shadow demons. Yeah. I told you at the beginning. Yeah. This is okay. Let's not have oh, it right yeah, next yeah. to the microphone. microphone. Yeah. This is how you have like demon apocalypses. You let <laughs> the shadow demons crawl out. I knew they were coming back because freaking shadow demons. Also, apparently there are chemicals in that shed so volatile that they touch and they instantly vaporize everything. The entire shed. Wow. Um, Terrible safety. No extra compliance. Okay, so for the next 60 or so years, what happens is... Well, first off, Napoleon III dies right the frick there, and his son becomes emperor, and he, and he um, signs a peace treaty that prevents a war that would have changed the course, you know, obviously changes the course of history... I'm not sure I'd ever heard before of the Franco-Prussian War, but apparently there was one. I guess it was important to the French. Anyway, it didn't happen now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but then scientists start disappearing all over the world. Yeah. So it basically stalls the development of human technology and into alternative energy fuels from coal. So, you know, basically these guys are the precursors of the Wakandans. In the sense of... Oh, the guy's stealing the scientists. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. It. They're not sharing tech with other people. Yeah. Yeah, but it's basically totally retarding human development. And no, not retarding is in, oh. Uh, Making it slow down. Yeah, obviously. Uh, yes, exactly. So humanity is kind of steam diesel punk tech. Yeah. But Europe runs out of coal, so they start burning trees. Then they cut down all the trees to fuel their machines and start looking at america which still has trees yeah and, and apparently they fight wars about this for like 10 years or something but it's kind of and, in the background but here's the thing that's as far as that plot point goes yeah it was actually pretty weird that like you know supposedly they turned to trees because they ran out of coal but we later see like a heap of coal just casually dumped upon some police pursuers could have been charcoal or something. Could have been charcoal, maybe. Burning coal. Or maybe they just, they didn't run out of coal entirely. They just kind of, there was a bottleneck while they opened up new mines or something. I don't know. But yeah, they didn't get around to oil and all the other stuff that normally would have gotten invented. So, wars and stuff happened. Anyway, all this is introduced in like the first ten minutes. And I remember being impressed by the speed of this and sort of disoriented, but in retrospect, you realize I needed most of those plot points. Uh, and, yeah, we cut to 1931, where the world is still in the steam age, thanks to the aforementioned disappearance of scientists. 
Uh, and all the remaining scientists are being held captive by their respective governments to make sure that they don't go missing. And so they can be forced to build weapons. Yeah, you know. Because, because governments like to do that. Uh, including a Dalek with a spiked ball and chain coming out of its eye Yeah, stock. that was a neat thing in the background. I'm guessing that was an intentional yeah. reference to Doctor Who. Yeah, that was definitely an intentional yeah. reference because it looked exactly like a Dalek. Yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> Um, and then we find that there's only one, three oak trees left in the entire world. Or there's only one of them in the, in France or in the city. Yeah, right? and we find out that Grandpa Dude, called Pops. Pops, goes to this tree every single day, which you think when you're on the run from the law would not be a good thing to have something very well, predictable. Well, his son tells him not, that's a bad idea, and he keeps it anyway. Yeah, and then we go over to their secret lab and stuff where it's revealed the police have been on to them for being scientists say who they is first so pops has two children or no, has his son and his wife and the three of them are all scientists and the son and the wife uh have the one daughter april who is let's say eight at this point maybe 10 and yeah, around there yeah and she clearly has an interest in science too and also has a talking cat by the way yeah. Because they figured out how to do that independently, uh, where they copied the yeah. formula from oh, their God. grandfather. Oh, and the grandfather has a shitty picture. It looks oh, like yeah, he's screaming in yeah. terror. That guy, is, those, I don't know what the deal is that was. That was funny, though. It was funny. It's just that that's the picture you chose for him. <laughs> okay, then. That's all we had. He had camera phobia. This is the best we could get you. <laughs> so they create this super serum, which will make everyone immortal. Yeah, they could do that, apparently. You can do that in the basement of a coal <laughs> factory. Yeah. It just with supplies you can buy on the street corner while running from the cops and the government. Yeah. Apparently, it's pretty easy to invent immortality. We never knew. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so they're inventing this for their own altruistic purposes of defeating death, which... Uh, yeah, I pointed out during the movie, yeah. yeah, we're already suffering from a resource shortfall. Let's, you know, make it worse by making sure that no one ever dies. Yeah, they did not address overpopulation as being a problem. They just skipped over that. Anyway. Yeah, even though it was kind of implicit because with the more people and the more resources and then more well, they, wars. You know, better energy sources would have helped, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but eventually, yeah. you know, entropy wins in the end. But oh, dear. Um, Then the police start busting down the door and stuff. And it turns out that Pops is kind of like MacGyver and, like, is really good at escaping police and stuff. Yeah. Um, I like to imagine he was a street urchin way back when and he's got all these uh, skills that he's yeah. built up over the years. Yeah. So uh, the mom and the dad drag April and the cat and the serum, which they inject into a snow globe. She does that a little later, but yeah. Um, and they run onto a, what is apparently a giant flying... Giant cable car between two Eiffel Towers that are holding up the wires. That just, because, of course, there's two Eiffel yeah, Towers. Yeah, it's just fun to see a world that's, like, so weird and different. Yeah, although, you know, you'd need scientists to develop the sort of tensile strength and material knowledge to do that. So, what, what is even the... Apparently, they don't take architects or engineers. Yeah, the lizards are very picky. You know, they only have so much time with their... Of course, it's not stated shit. that it's the lizards. This is stated, like, towards the end of the movie. But yeah. we're spoiling it now because that's what we do with every frickin' review. Yep. Uh, and what? Yeah. So then the lizards decide to be inconspicuous and kidnap these open scientists now. Oh, wait. No, they don't. They fly a cloud in and start shooting people with lightning bolts. Yeah, that's inconspicuous. It's, uh, it just looks like everyone died. Honestly, I thought when the parents get zapped by lightning, I thought they were dead. And I was like, oh my gosh, you just killed off these main characters. Like, with no even build-up Harley's like, And then lightning came by, and I was like, holy frick, what are these sort of, you know, weird things are you going to throw at me here? Uh, so I didn't realize until later that like, there was a ship inside the cloud. Yeah, I kind of figured there was a ship inside the cloud, or that there were actual shadow demons, like I said before. Ah, uh, yeah. But, um... That'd be cool. Yeah. So, then... We show that the leader of the group that was chasing the inspector that was chasing oh, around. Oh, the inspector guy. What was his name? Oh, my God. Uh, Piazzo? Yeah, let's call it Piazzo. Uh, he Pizzoni. Has, Pizzoni. Pizzoni has been stalking, decides to stalk April because she's been shoved into an orphanage now. And because he got disgraced because a shit ton of people died when the thing exploded and they failed to capture anyone 
Yeah, but since the daughter was innocent, she was just shoved in an orphanage. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he's been stalking her for the last 10 years because, I mean, there's a 10-year time skip where yeah. she grows it's up. 1941 and, now. She's like 18 or 20. Yeah, he, so Piazzo's been stalking April because he figures she'll lead him to the grandpa so he'll get his job back. Yeah, and more precisely, he's been paying someone else to stalk her, and the latest person stalker he's paid um, is Julius. I keep and wanting to say Caesar. Yeah. <laughs> nope, not quite. So, uh, yeah, April is a petty thief, um, but she's also a scientist in secret and lives inside of the equivalent of the Statue of Liberty, but I guess it's the Statue of Conquering. Yeah, by the way, we see what the Statue of Liberty actually is in this universe, and it's a cowboy holding a gun in the air. Yeah. It's amazing. (laughs) I mean, I'm not saying let's glorify guns, especially since that's a bit of a hot topic issue here in uh, March of 2018. But it's a statue of a cowboy firing a gun in the air <laughs> yeah. as your version it's of the just, Statue of Liberty. It's just very American is what we're Give saying. Give us our tired, your poor, your huddled <laughs> masses yearning to yee <laughs> <laughs> I would love that to be the actual poem. <laughs> <laughs> and just, it says yee and then there's parentheses, shot, sounds of gunfire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and we see they're being watched. And even though they said electricity has never been invented... There's, like, rats and other things. Pigeons, the little, like, roboticized. Yeah. And they're transmitting messages back to the, what will be revealed later is the lizard people. Yeah. 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 That's fun. Um, and it's revealed that she's working on creating an ultimate serum to help cure uh, Darwin. Darwin, the cat. Who is super old at this point. Yeah, because he's a cat. <laughs> yeah. Moving right along there. Um, she needs more uh, materials for the serum. So she goes to a science fair. I mean, what, uh, a fair. Like a and, world's fair type thing with science. And sees a magician guy who's doing science experiments in the open because magic. Yeah, that's, that's about <laughs> as good of an experience. <laughs> He's just demonstrating stuff and maybe putting a magic flare on. Anyway, she steals some stuff from him and almost gets caught. But Julius helps her out. And in the meantime, and Julius is helping her out not because he's nice necessarily. He's also been ordered make sure she doesn't get taken in by the police because if she was, then she couldn't go and talk to her grandpa. And also because if he she can't talk to her grandpa, then Piazzo can't bring in the grandpa and yeah. get his job back. Yeah, yeah, Pizzoni. Pizzoni, whatever. Uh, look, Chef Boyardee is <laughs> really upset that. Apparently, Julius shows up and says, yep, nothing's changed. So he goes, I'm going to reiterate the orders I gave you and are the whole reason you're meeting with me because exposition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit of that. Um, let's see. So April recreates the serum and she she fails apparently mm-hmm. and smashes the globe and some of the fluid leaks out. Well, she yeah, it doesn't even smash. Uh, she keeps – most of it stays inside, but some of it leaks out. And Darwin licks some of it, like, when he's just apparently on the edge of death. And then suddenly he's better again. It's like, oh my gosh, the serum was in this snow globe the entire time. And by the way we're phrasing it, you already know this is a red herring. But it was an effective red herring at the time. Yeah, we, I thought it was the snow globe. I yeah. thought the snow globe was the MacGuffin for the series. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it functioned that way. Moby. Aha. God fucking damn it. It functioned that way, and then it was revealed right at the end. Is aha. Um, thought. Okay, and so... You know, the lizards have a spy rat with robot implants. Yep. yep, yep, yep. Roll with it. Roll with it. Um, so they send their evil cloud this helicopter is, thing. Yeah, no, this is when you don't and, know that it's a cloud you know, a helicopter thing. It's just like, and so we're meeting the, inside Napoleon's head, and then a cloud comes by with death lasers, and you're like, what is going on in this movie? And it lasers <laughs> off the statue of Napoleon's head because that's where the, the um, April's house is. Because run with it. Yeah. So Julius and um, Darwin and April run for their lives. And they hide in this factory that is also an opera house. Yep. Because apparently industrialization has so taken over that they can't afford to have opera houses anymore. And everything has been turned over to mechanization. Yeah. yeah so thanks, lizards. Um, anyways. Um, and they... Oh, we forgot to mention, just before the cloud shows up, the rat that was spying on them suddenly starts talking to them in radio voice. 
and it's April's dad, who I thought was dead. And he's like, hey, April, you're in danger. Go to the oak tree, the one oak tree in the entire city. And then the cloud shows up and zaps everything. And you're like, is the rat on our side? Is the rat not on our side? Is the rat her father? And Darwin kills the rat. <laughs> like, hey, look, uh, this is not the weirdest part of the movie, so <laughs> just keep moving. <laughs> then um, they go to the oak tree and they find uh, Pops, who says, wait an hour and then go to this address and enter this code into the door and do the thing. Uh, so they go to that address without waiting for an hour, and Pops comes home, and he's like, Shit, I told you to wait for an hour. I wanted to surprise you. <laughs> oh, well, I guess it's not a surprise. Yeah, you're only the the only living relative of this girl that she knows about and has been gone for ten years. You know, this is not surprising at all. <laughs> oh, and it's a house that's inside of an aircraft hangar because... Yeah. yeah. Um... Okay, so then apparently he's been experimenting with electricity this whole time. And he goes out to track down the rodent robot thing to maybe get a clue as to what the frick is going on. And he goes out alone. And then Julius secretly sells him out, goes to a payphone, and tells him, All right, I found Pops, but I didn't find April because he's not willing to betray her. Because he's, he's in love with her, even though he's known her for all of ten minutes and probably doesn't even know her last goddamn name. I don't know her last. No, it's Franklin. All right, but uh, yeah, the love angle was kind of. It was forced. In. If it had just been at the I end, mean, you know, yeah. like in the distant future, they're married. Yeah, that might have been easier. It's yeah, like like thing. maybe like them hugging and being friends and stuff, and then maybe implying that later on that would lead to a romance. Yeah. That would have been better, but you know they didn't go that route, so whatever. Um, but it turns out that so the cops arrest uh, Pops, and oh, specifically that one inspector, Pizzoni arrests Pops, and then he brings him down to this meeting place where they're going to, um, uh, you know, turn him over. And he's like, "All right, so here's Pops. I finally found him for ten years. Is my career back on track?" And they're like, "One, thank you for capturing that wanted criminal." Two, you are also under arrest. <laughs> He's like, why? Because we gave you an order ten years ago not to go after this guy. He's like, damn it! <laughs> you guys had to get caught up on that one thing and they arrest both of them. <laughs> okay, uh, here's my question. He's a wanted criminal. Why did he bring him to this clandestine meeting under a bridge? Why not bring him to police headquarters? Yeah, that was a little weird. Where he works. That was a little weird. I don't know. Video, oh, also, you know, when he's taking the phone call, because they have phones but no electricity. You notice he had to, like, pump it with his foot to yeah, make that it go. Yeah, that was like, kind of weird. But... implied that it's yeah, one of crappy the... technology. Like, there was, a, there was a prostitute handcuffed to a pole next to... Really? Yep. I did not notice that. I was busy with the technology. Yeah, well... Mm. <laughs> I was looking at the characters trying to identify what the fuck was going on, right, so... Right, right. <laughs> So they're both thrown in this secret underground, undercastle layer that's under the water. Cause. <laughs> uh, yes, they're both taken there. Meanwhile, um, they turn on a prototype that was obviously foreshadowed that would be turned on. That uh, would wait, wait. They meaning uh, back at the house. Yeah, back at the house. Uh, April turns on this prototype that generates electricity. And apparently electricity, when you first turn it on, is a giant orb of magnetic lightning death. Yeah. And then Julius rushes in. He's like, what's going on? She's like, do something. He's like, okay. And then gets zapped by lightning and falls over. And she has to, like, fix it herself. And I was like, hey, subverting the damsel in distress angle. Oh, please. I like it. We've subverted it so much over the last 20 years that, honestly, the damsel in distress trope is only really in play, in my opinion, when it's either done in a heroic sense. I mean, done in, like, a traditional sense, like Mario and Princess Peach. Yeah. Um... Or when it's pointed out how much it's done. Because honestly, Damsel in Distress, I think, has gone down a lot over the it last has, couple of years. Yeah, recently it's been changing. Um, there's probably more examples out there than I know. For instance, I'm just guessing, just from reputation, there's probably more of that in the Fast and Furious series that I never watch. Right? I wouldn't it's know. It's all manly, also... gung-ho stuff. I bet they rescued Damsel. Anyway. <laughs> Dude, when you're The Rock, everyone else is a damsel. <laughs> I would like you to, yeah, that's, yeah. By the way, we were originally going to watch the A-Team, the 2010 version, 
But guess what I couldn't find? I'll give you a hint. That movie. Because I've seen clips from it, and it is stupidly awesome. Including flying a tank <laughs> and an awesome cop- helicopter chase scene. Oh, uh, wow. Flying a tank. Yes. We need to see that. I'll give you a Oh, yeah, I'll show you the clip later because, goddamn, man, just goddamn. Okay, by the way, for, I forget who it was that says we should watch My Hero Academia. That is still coming up. We've uh, almost caught up now. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, yes. So, yes, the wreck of the house and, and the, the electric the, thing. The, the lizards in their secret underground base. Again, I'd like to pause to <laughs> say that I just said that out loud. That is a thing that happens in this movie. The lizards detect that, oh, there's electromagnetic energy being produced. Someone's discovering electricity. Get them. Yeah. So they do. Um, they send their cloud laser death chopper. <laughs> with they laser through the ceiling with the doom laser thing and it looks so and, and then they drop down shock troopers in power armor. Yeah. Which turn out yeah. to be more lizards. Yeah, you didn't at first they looked like they were just robots or something. I like Which, you know, that's not even the weirdest thing in this movie, so no, let's go not, with yeah. okay. <laughs> uh anyways. Uh so while they're being surrounded by shock troopers, they activate the oh, because by the way, Darwin was spot you know, went and found out that Pops had been uh in prison and where he was going, and then Darwin comes back to the house and then they attack and then they hit the button to up armor the whole house. And then it grows legs it and legs. runs into the, into the river yep. where it swims away. Yes. <laughs> okay, at, there, there's a certain point at which you have too much free time on your hands. Yeah, I know. You have reached it, Pops. Just imagine what you could accomplish I... if he wasn't busy visiting a tree every day. Yeah, but you know, no electricity, so God forbid. <laughs> Well, Here's my thing about Pops. Yeah. He's an omnidisciplinary scientist. Absolutely. I mean, that is just... Uh, that's a trope that I don't really like. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, okay. I if, mean, if you're Dr. Doom, sure. Mm. If you're Reed Richards and you're verified to be the smartest human being in the entire universe, fine. But this guy just learns new scientific disciplines and goes, Oh, let's see. What's this technology? Oh, yes. I know how to pilot this hovercraft. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it runs on electricity, of course, even though I didn't even turn on the electric prototype thingy. I mean, at least he had one, so he knows what electricity is. Yeah, but then he's like, oh, yes, of course it runs through this, and it's yeah. magnetic, and he's describing all these things, and it's like, so you just, you're, you do have a superpower. You have access to the script. Yeah, um, but we're not there quite there yet. So the, well, okay, yeah, so he, he's taken prisoner at this one fort, secret underground Keep going. Somewhat underground for thing. And um, he, yeah, they're, they're working on new weapons and stuff. And they recovered one of the uh, lizard chopper things that had crashed into an ocean Again, a while ago. Again, I'd like to say that is a real thing. That it's a real today. thing. Calls Sith King from across the room. And um, so Pops, like, pretty much immediately figures out how it works, or at least during the time it takes to get from Paris to wherever that one fort is. They showed it briefly on the map. Uh, I'm going to assume there was a a few hours, maybe a day. I don't know. Um, To get there. And nobody noticed the house because they were underwater the whole time. And the lizards also couldn't find them, I guess. Anyway. um, So, uh, the house approaches the fort from underneath the sea and starts digging at it with its house robot spider legs Again, real thing. and like pokes holes in it and the place starts flooding real thing. and Pizzoni uh, escapes his cell and our heroes rush in to find pops and they're like maybe we can escape with the house and they're like oh the house has been nuked by now or not really nuked but bombed depth charged, depth charged. Um, so it's cool, though, because we have this, this hovercraft VTOL thingy, and Pops already knows how to fly it, and they, like, shoot the door, and they fly on out, and they've escaped, and they're flying out over the ocean now, and he turns on the automatic pilot, but he can't figure out how to work the guidance system, which apparently, you know I mean, apparently, though, like, the automatic pilot has to have a guidance system in order to pilot it all, right? So I guess he could only, it's just the display he couldn't get working, I don't know. Um, 
But yeah, then they stumble upon the instructional video <laughs> where the lizards are like, you know, they just show up on the video. I remember like after this point, I was like, there aren't lizard people in this movie. Um, no, no, no. What happened was I stopped the video as soon as the lizard people show up. I got up, I walked out of the room, and I stared out the window for a few minutes. <laughs> just like, my God. <laughs> this is happening. Okay, so, yes, just getting at that reaction. Uh, and the video is like, hello, scientists. Uh, thank you for joining our great project. You will be put to good use in helping the benefit of life everywhere. And we will treat you well. And please let us know if you uh, have need anything. And if you're airsick, here's a bag for that. And bleh. Um, have a pleasant flight. And I just love that little, I don't know, almost GLaDOS-esque thing to it. <laughs> we're, like, doing this evil doom plan thing. But, uh, yes, we're going to be polite about it or something. Oh, God. Um. Oh, Lord God. So, the automatic pilot takes them to the secret base as they fly on this tunnel. And turns out, Pizzoni's on board, because he escaped and was on board the whole time. And he starts smashing the crap out of the interior mechanics of this thing so that they will crash rather than be taken prisoner so no no what he says is i heard the whole story i'd rather die than be a prisoner of the lizards i paused it at that moment and said he's right now the most sympathetic character he heard the plan and he said you know what nope 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 i am done i'm out fuck this shit i'm out <laughs> and he just starts smashing the engines yeah which does cause them to crash, thankfully, in a way that leaves no one with any fatalities or even injuries. Although, as we see later, you know, Darwin probably could have died and it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, but everyone else still. Nobody broke a leg after you crashed in a shuttle, or a ship rather, that broke into multiple pieces on its way down. Usually that leads to somebody dying. Yeah. Yeah. Then the lizards are like, yeah, we got to find them because they have the serum and we need the serum. Yep. Oh, God damn it. So there's a whole jungle out there. Jungle, swamp, forest thing. Yeah, because of course. Because they have all the trees. They stole all the trees, I guess. Or they're just better at planting them. Um, and we saw earlier that April's dad is prisoner in the world's worst designed prison. But it looks cool. Because it's, uh, the bars are just these red lasers that incinerate anything that touches them. Which, A, if the power goes out, you have no more prison. And, B, if your prisoner happens to trip for some reason, you just lost your prisoner. And if, the say, the scientist was someone you really needed but would rather die than work with you. Yeah. We'll put you in this cell to think about what you've... <laughs> That's an instant way to make someone, you know, able to kill themselves. Instant yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you don't offer instant death anyway, fields. turns out he and his wife are at odds. She wants to work with the lizards for the project, whatever it is. And he's like, no, these lizards are jerks. And that's why he sent April the message to help her and won't tell anybody, you know, where she is or any of that. So, oh, we're wandering around in the jungle thing. Oh, and by the way, Julius's betrayal got revealed and Pops figured it out. So April's yeah, he got him. revealed in the weakest possible way. He wasn't so super weak I mean, okay the first thing he says is my you see there were two pieces of information that uh pizzoni, Pia, pizzoni. wait pizzoni says right there pizzoni. pizzoni knew about me the first is that i was called pops and that's like ugh. calling someone pops is not some weird nickname calling someone pops is what you do when you're derogatorily insulting of an older person that's just what you do i can list dozens of examples in fiction where someone called an old person pops it's possible this made more sense in french yeah it's possible that that yeah mm. what was the other clue uh, the other clue was just knowing his location after he'd successfully avoided the guy for 10 years so yeah that makes some sense yeah okay that makes a little uh, more that's, sense that's you know yeah, yeah that's odd that you would know that and and then, uh, yeah, Julius confesses to it when he's cornered in high. So now April's mad at Julius. And Julius is like, well, but I only did it because, you know, I was threatened with prison otherwise and all this. Uh, so they're lost in this jungle. And Julius and April try the old dress up as the bad guys technique. They put on uniforms of the scientists. So I'll wear these identical red uniforms. 
And they're like, excuse me, colleague, could you tell me where the Franklins are currently being held captive? And he's like, who the heck are you? Security! And you're like, ah, oh, crap, that didn't work. Uh, yeah, but then we see that these brilliant scientists haven't invented something called a surge protector because apparently one guy, one lizard in power armor, I just said that, shoots the generator. All the power goes out for the entire facility. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. cool. <laughs> that was smart. No, no, that wasn't. That was really stupid. <laughs> Uh, power goes out, and then the prisoners are suddenly released, because there's also no guards at this prison, to be mentioned. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, this could be useful if they had walls or bars. Yeah, all you need is a bar. But, nope, couldn't couldn't find one of those, or a few of those. Um, but, so, oh, and Pops had been taken captive, along with uh, Pizzoni. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they reunited with Pops' son, what's his name? And now they're free, and they go walking around, and then Pizzoni is such an annoyance, and once they leave, they're like, okay, fine, the exit's that way, and they leave him behind. In the meantime, April and Julius meet up with April's mom, who, without actually lying to them, doesn't really get around to saying, by the way, I'm totally on board with the lizards on this, uh, and leads them right to where all the lizards are hanging out. And they turn the lights on, because they got the backup generators working. And voila, there's a giant rocket right there with a drill on the top and vines all over the outside. So it turns out that the serum that was inside of the snow globe, that didn't work. Yeah, I kind of like that, that idea. Yeah, because they had both the scientists there. They could have recreated it with all this high-tech equipment and stuff. Yeah. And it didn't work. Yeah, they were on the wrong track this whole time. Oh, there you go. That makes sense. But then the daughter was able to actually create it. And didn't even realize it because of that mix-up right at the moment of, uh, you know, Darwin took both things within a couple of minutes of each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that was cool. And, all right, we need you to recreate that serum for us. And Shazam, I want to see, say, see. Um, that one that the, the female the, lizard, the, yeah, because the, there's there's a whole bunch of the kids lizards that are henchmen, and then a male and female that are uh, running the joint. And she says, "Look, here's our plan. We need this serum that makes life forms immortal, and we're gonna make a bunch of uh, spores from this jungle immortal and put them on this rocket ship, and we're going to send the rocket into deep space where it will explode." And then the spores will go everywhere because they're immortal. They can, like, survive anything now. And they'll land on different planets and stuff. And life in the broader universe will exist even if humans manage to wipe themselves out here on Earth. And I was like, that's a surprisingly interesting plan you people have there. Like, you're trying to ensure the broader survival of life. Huh. Okay. That's more, like, sympathetic than I was See, thinking of. I immediately started poking holes in it because yeah. I'm me and yeah. I can't help myself. Yeah. So what happened, here's what I think. First off, so you built a rocket. You need this rocket to be able to go out into space. Okay, fine. We haven't heard anything about rocket, the fathers of modern rocketry. So maybe you took those people. Here's the thing. We can barely get shit out of our own solar system now. The furthest thing out was the Voyager probe, and that's been going out for 50 years or so. Yeah, and it's even if it's beyond the reach of our solar system, it's definitely not inside someone else's solar system. That's four light years away at minimum. Yeah. Oh, but let's get into why else this is really fucking stupid. Your plan is to explode and send the spores everywhere in the universe. Like we said, light will be traveling much faster than these spores will go, and that takes four years to get to another star system. And now, I'm not sure exactly how... I don't know how they've stress-tested this immortality thing, but I'm pretty sure that the spores don't have the ability to decelerate, so any if they manage to go, let's say, at light speed, which is how they could get to anywhere at a reasonable fraction amount of time, They'd still be going at light speed and slamming into the planet. And I don't think that they were designed... Immortality Serum was designed to, oh, I don't know, shrug off <laughs> sea speed impacts. Gosh, they could but end up, like, destroying planets instead. But let's say that they don't. The spores still won't reach anywhere in millions, if not billions of years. Or at least hundreds of thousands. 
assuming that it's going as fast as the Voyager probes. But again, these can't slow down because they're spores. They're not spaceships. And again, the Voyager probes have been going for 50 years or so. And they're still not out of the solar system. And they're the fastest objects we've ever made. As a species. But even leaving all that aside. Even if they say exploded, eh, I don't know, part of the way, the spores wouldn't go anywhere because the gravitational effect of the sun and the solar system would suck all those spores eventually back into the sun. And here's a little spoiler alert. I don't think that it would work against spore immortality versus sun. The sun wins. Yeah, okay, so the the partial rescue for this is they're just populating the planets of our solar system. And they should have phrased it that way. We'll put life on Mars and the moon and Venus and oh. nowhere else. <laughs> but, you know, they seem to be really eager to leap into this plan without stress testing these things. You know, these, yeah. they are supposed to be scientists. Yeah. Even he said, even Pop said, we need to test this serum before we do anything Especially with it. when in the epilogue it's revealed that for some reason the serum doesn't work on humans. And you're like, oh, what else doesn't it work on? Vines, maybe? Or whatever else you were planning to do? <laughs> yeah, let's see. Um, okay, so you plan to... Why not explode this missile in the atmosphere of one planet instead of trying to populate all of them? That would seem to be a better test of this. And mm. then if that works, you send out more missiles. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be You're easier trying just... to do too many things with one thing, and that's not proper science. No, it's not. It's okay. almost like the whole thing was run by lizards in power armor. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know so, they, were, they were kind of ridiculous from the moment they uh started so eh. <laughs> so they force april to make the serum but it turns out that uh uh julius was like a con man and a magician earlier so he like yeah he did. does a sleight of hand thing which unfortunately i was able to see coming you know i'm sure for other people to be a big twist because they make this little bit she's like oh julius hand me this thing and he's like, oh, you sure you want to do this thing? He's like, Julius, this is the wrong one. This is water. And then she makes the serum properly. Uh, and it happens to be the same color as the water from a moment ago. I'm like, ah, oh, he's going to switch those. He did an earlier bit where he established his sleight of hand techniques. Yeah, except that Regulus? Regula? The male blizzard. The one that was J.K. Simmons. Rodrigue. Yeah, Rodrigue. Um... He reveals that the violent guy who's been announcing that he'd like to do violent things and shows an utter disdain for the humans this whole time is evil. Dun, he, plans dun, dun. To, he plans to use the serum on his own children, blow up the missile inside of Earth's atmosphere, utterly destroying all life except for those that he deems worthy, and then having his children repopulate the Earth. Yeah. Because fuck humanity. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a mustache twirly plot right there. Just destroy everything, damn it. Then uh, the mom, uh, Shimen, Sh Shimen, decides, yeah, no, let's not do that. So he shoots her, and then says, "Children, join me." And that starts a civil war amongst the lizards. So glad that you're not violent and cruel and mean <laughs> like those humans are. Yep, yep. I'm so glad. I'm great, 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 great. You fucking idiot. <laughs> Um, let's see, Julius eventually shoots Rodrigue, who's like, ha ha, I'm immortal, bitches, and then he realizes, oh wait, no I'm not, bleh. Mm. Um, then they shove Darwin in the rocket, because they can't turn the rocket off, and, uh, she... Uh, you think April... there should be an emergency stop switch somewhere, but... Yeah, eh, this... Or, like, a hatch so that you can get the rocket out of here and maybe not build it under the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, I love the, the rocket. They, we were wondering, like, why is there a drill on the top of the rocket? Because I'd forgotten how this part. And it doesn't, like, open up a thing in the ceiling above them. It just drills through the ceiling, which happens to be directly under the Eiffel Tower. And it drills through one of the two Eiffel Towers. And it's ridiculous, but it was still so cool to watch. I mean, you had that opening hatch in Normandy where there was no one around. I'm thinking you could buy up the land using, like, some patents. Yeah. 
You think so? Um, okay, so yeah, Darwin gets on board. We can set the altimeter so the thing will explode at a very high uh, altitude and not like very low. And we're all running around the rocket trying to escape. And April throws the serum, the actual serum, at the side of the rocket where all the vines are. And uh, the vines become immortal because she figures we might as well put this serum to good use. Uh, and populate Mars with plants and stuff. And so the rock, rocket, rocket goes takes up, off. Rocket explodes. It, 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 well, it I love, escape. I love the moment where it explodes because it, it goes up and you're like, okay, okay, maybe we're okay. And then it blows up. It's animated so big, it really looks like they just ate the entire planet with this explosion. <laughs> it's like, oh god, did we actually just die? <laughs> yeah, this would not be the weirdest film. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. Yeah. So everyone escapes. Turns out Pizzoni, like there's an epilogue thing. Pizzoni gets honored for like thwarting the lizard's evil plan, even though he did no such thing. Um, you know what? Let's let's give it to him. He's been through enough he's shit. He's been today. through plenty of. He's been yeah. through a lot of shit today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and it turns out that they can't replicate the serum's effect on humans, which I'm calling bullshit on. For some reason, yeah, that's weird. It works on cats and plants, but not humans. I'd like I'm to know what's different said, about us. I'm betting April just said, no, it doesn't work on humans. Wink, wink. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah, because that would make more sense, honestly. Yeah. Cause... Uh, oh, and then the first um, uh, man on the moon happens in, like, 2001, apparently. And freaking Darwin is there. And he's been there the whole time. And apparently... Has managed to entertain himself for all these years. Good on you, Darwin. But that was cool, though. It's like, like, he really is immortal. He survived the explosion. Earth, I mean, the moon and Venus and yeah. um, Mars are all replantified and stuff. Yeah, so that's cool. The evil scheme ended up doing some good. Well, also, it, somehow none of the spores flew backwards in the earthly direction, because otherwise we'd have unkillable triffids all over the planet. <laughs> Uh, enough roundup and that'll those things will die. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. Enough roundup and anything will die. Dun dun dun. Yeah. <laughs> so my thoughts on this movie are as follows. What is this? I don't even. <laughs> this movie is fucking weird, but it is enjoyable. Yeah. It's a. Uh, it kind of feels like a standard popcorn flick, you know. It, it just had more imagination than the average popcorn flick. In all the the random. Uh, technologies, the cable cars, the zany. It, it was, it was, it was bringing back a old genre of some kind. You know what I mean? Uh, this, this retro ste- futuristic, retro future type of thing. Yeah, uh, and I liked it. It stands out from other movies that way. You know, at least uh, recent movies. Yeah. Um. And they kept throwing this weird sort of twists at you. Kept you on your toes. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't bad. It, it yeah. was just weird. Yeah. I mean, I, I liked it. I might watch it again at some point in the future, but you know what? It's For what it is, it's good. Yeah, I understand. Although um, I'm confused as to how the spores would survive on Venus, because, you know, the air pressure there is like having the Empire State Building on top of you while being 900 degrees centigrade. They can't land stuff on Venus because it keeps melting. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's, that's hotter than the melting point of lead there. Jesus Christ, people. And these things survive there? Yeah. Also, where did the atmosphere on the moon come from? He said, oh, the atmosphere is breathable. <laughs> but how, how did there get to be an atmosphere? You can't say, oh, because the plants were there, they produced the oxygen. Where did they get the water from? Where did they get yeah. the carbon dioxide yeah, from? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you it, it, like it, it adheres just close enough to actual science to piss you off when it doesn't adhere yeah, to science. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Like, the cable car stuff is like, alright, I know what that is, basically. And, I mean, talking animals is weird, but, like, okay, you can handle that. Uh, power armor is feasible. And then this serum is just freaking magic, if you think about it. <laughs> but, yeah, rejiggering the plot so that the serum is not magic would be kind of hard. Yeah, because uh, that's kind of the driving thrust of the plot. Yeah, it is. It is. In theory, you could have done more to get into um, some of the details, some of the characters' motivations. I'm thinking of the villains mainly. Because I counted this time. There's seven times where Rodrigue is like, let's do something violent. And the Shimon's like, please, Rodrigue, stop being so violent. And it was kind of blunt about it. It'd be neat to see Rodrigue as a more developed character who's... I don't know, really pissed off at humanity, you know, wants revenge, and, and you could see more of his psyche and stuff beyond just like, aha, I'm the villain, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, same with Shaman. Does she have like you know deeper altruistic motives? Could she have a pet the dog moment or something? Could she show some regret that they had to kidnap all these scientists, but she really thinks it's for the better good? You know, and the details of all that, rather than just the plot kind of running at full pay speed. You know. Uh, Why are they bothering to do this plot about s s immortal plants in space? Like, have they been trying to make immortality serum for the last 70 years or so? Because, uh, like, and then this one group of scientists on the street corner in literally the basement managed to do it. Were they just really pissed when that happened? <laughs> yeah. Dang it. How did that happen? Uh, yeah, also, no. why not help the humans on Earth? If you think they're doing pro doing wrong, then why don't you help them? Say See, that would be a good uh, area for more expansion. If, you know, Rod Rieg could be kind of misleading Shaman about... Uh, the the capabilities of helping humans, right? She could be like, no, we could do this like thing with orphanages. He's like, oh no, I tried that, but then the humans blew it up the next day, and he's like lying, you know, and and mm -hmm. and then and then the moment where they fight could be a, a, a deeper sense of betrayal and more like details to it. No, wait, you lied about that thing, and yes, but I did it for your own good. And maybe he could feel kind of sad about having to like kill his wife, essentially mm -hmm. his wife. Um, but he'll do it anyway for like, you know, this is necessary for the, the, the children to repopulate the earth. And there are several more layers that theoretically could have been in there. What I was interested more in was the fact that they seemed to imply that Europe was going to go to war with America. Yeah, that was where they skipped over that. Like, well, they, they mentioned in 1941 after the time skip and Darwin's like, how's it going? And she's like, oh, it's the same as ever the war. And another scientist has gone missing this time in Rome. Now, tell me about Rome. And they... Skip over that part where we're still at war. Um, I guess what the writer's trying to do there is just establish that it's still a kind of crappy world, and that would sort of lead to the idea of, oh, humanity is crappy, and let's populate space or something. Yeah, It wasn't I, fully connected in. It you know? sounded like that there was going to be lead-in to a big war plot, and then that was going to be orchestrated by the lizards who were trying to destroy humanity or something. Yeah, that could be another thing. If Rodrigue has been deceiving Shemen, he could be one uh, actually encouraging nations to fight with each other because he wants to you know, limit the number of humans that exist so it'll be easier to kill the rest of them with his bombs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that could be cool. Also, why did Emperor Napoleon III want guerrilla super soldiers? Because he's a Marvel fan. <laughs> in the 1860s <laughs> no seriously why did he want super soldiers that were also gorillas yeah i know it's weird he should be feeding those to uh you feed the serum to humans yeah you know actual humans who would listen to you theoretically yeah yeah they, they, they should have just rephrased that easy enough be like we we're testing it on animals at first but is it ready for human experimentation yet well not yet your majesty and uh, for these reasons you know mm -hmm. um and you could even say of that second there that that one guy with the gun he could be like yeah he's supposed to be the first test subject and he's you know he's my most loyal subject or something you know what i'm saying you could tie I mean, it in as somehow. much as i would love to see Ca capitan francois <laughs> you know that would be <laughs> captain france you I know. know that would be amazing <laughs> he throws a shield shaped like france <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, I'm sure there is wait, an actual wait, Captain this France. Is, this is Vibranium <laughs> from the nation of total freaks and jerk asses who limit technology. <laughs> they stole it from the lizards. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'll have to admit, um, as much as I found April likable, when I try to explain to myself what her character development was over the movie, it's actually pretty vague. Well, to be fair, the movie happened over the course of, like, what, two days? Yeah, well, you could have made a movie that took more time. Um, because, basically, you know, she wants her parents back, because, of course, she does. And she uh, wants she Pops doesn't... back, because, of course, she does. No, she was hoping Okay, to... yeah, but the, her primary motivation in making the serum was... Why? What was her motivation in making the serum? Was it making her cat better? It's her best friend, so it's not just, like, a random cat. Okay, but, yeah, you're making... But that's true. Does she have any thoughts about the broader implications of this? Does she want humanity to be immortal? Like, is that a philosophical question we're wrestling with? Or, nah, it's more of a plot point. She's trying to save the cat. Uh, and moving on. <laughs> right? Um, and... so, so, like, why do you have... So, you mastered the art of... the philo You created a philosopher's stone to save a cat. 
I mean, it's a talking cat. It helps, but I know what you mean. It's still, it could be used on infinite numbers of people. Uh, you know what? If the absolute quantity of the serum were limited, that would make some of this make more sense. Mm -hmm. So it requires a special ingredient that is only found in the most ridiculous circumstances or something. And, uh, so yeah, that's why. And then we don't have to do this whole, it doesn't work on humans, but it's just like, no, literally we ran out of, uh, Extendio Lithium or something. <laughs> you know what's sad? Schlock Mercenary, a fucking webcomic, is handling this better in their most recent overstory arc. I don't know if you've been keeping up with it. No, I've not been keeping up with that. Um, basically, they found the main characters found life extension technology. And by life extension, they mean actually immor actual immortality. Including thrown into a sun immortality or ageless immortality? Uh, yes. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, it doesn't stop you from getting killed, but now there's degrees of death. Um, because it's through nanites. Um, you can back up your brain about every 24 hours or so. Maybe more, maybe less. Or every hour if you're feeling, you know. Paranoid. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll clone you a new body, um, insert the data from the nanites, and then you'll be back to normal. That raises all sorts of philosophical questions, doesn't it? Which, which they're trying to answer and stuff. Like, we're going to run out of living space for people. We're going to... Murder mysteries that were solved hundreds of... Or thousands of years ago. Even millions of years ago. They're suddenly relevant again because we're going to have to eventually deal with cases that old ourselves. Oh. Um, hmm. Where are we going to get the resources to continue living the way we do? Um, we need to learn how to get along better because we're going to just keep doing this shit again and again and again. They're studying, like, ancient cycles of galactic extinction of entire civilizations and ways that they survived so that they don't repeat the mistakes of the past that leads to extinction. Admittedly, that's a, a comic that takes place over months and months and years. But still, though, you know, yeah. a, a webcomic should not be delving more into the philosophical mysteries of immortality than, than a movie with much more budget. <laughs> than saying. a movie with, like, at least 20 producers or something. <laughs> yeah, they had the world's longest opening credits. Yeah. Everyone was involved in this thing. I mean, good for them. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, she didn't really go through the large implications of that. And, yeah, it feels like... If her moment at the end there is choosing to throw the serum at the vines, that should be a big character moment. Or she should have an equivalent character moment. Like, this is the point where she decides to, you know, use one she ideal or, and reject the other, you know. Or, or become this sort of person and refuse that temptation. Or but this is the character development thing. She's never tempted. Yeah. She's never, you know, has this... Should I side with one thing or another? Should I reject Even though this? her parents are actually at feuding with each other, she's never in a spot to be, like, you know, stuck between two ideologies and wondering what's the best cause. You know what her personality is? Hmm. It's generic, assertive female protagonist. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I admit. Um, even she though, don't like, need no man. Well, wait a minute. She wasn't sassy about it. Okay, well, yes, <laughs> but still. I, I mean, I found, I found her likable enough. Um, She's likable, but yeah. I struggle to find anything about her that really stands out to me mm. that I couldn't, like, find in another character. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they and they, they already said that the romance arc was kind of shoehorned in there. You um, could have honestly removed Jules from almost every scene in the movie, and you really wouldn't have made a difference. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Darwin remarks briefly near the beginning about oh april you're kind of, you're afraid to meet people because you're afraid that you'll lose them like she's lost her parents and her grandfather in the past and that could have been a major character point you know it, being afraid of loss and then learning to get over that over the course of the movie perhaps yeah but we don't see that oh no, yeah character. we don't we don't see that but i'm just saying that's like a possible thing you could have done uh, especially if you're doing a plot that revolves around an immortality serum you could easily connect that to a fear of loss somehow, right? Yeah, I mean, hell, Mass Effect explored that better with the Asari. They're not even immortal. They just live for a thousand years. But they know that almost every single partner that they'll ever take will not be over a thousand years old. Live to be over a thousand years old. There's actually an Asari you can talk to on one of the planets. 
This is like one of my favorite quests in Mass Effect 2. Here's what happens. You see an Asari standing at a booth, and you can talk to her and stuff to buy stuff. Um, there is a Krogan, a.k.a. the Orcs of Space, except way more awesome, because they're like a T-Rex mixed with an Orc, and then give them shotguns, and possibly psychic powers. Because yes. And he's like standing like uh, about 20 feet away, screaming at her all this poetry he's written all about her, because he is in love with her, but she doesn't know how to commit. And part of the reason she doesn't know how to commit is, she says, and this is just in a very matter-of-fact way, it's not like an Asari or a Salarian where they'll be gone. I mean, it's not like a Turian or a Salarian or a human where they'll be gone in a few decades. If I marry him, we'll be together forever. And that's actually, I mean, she's really insensitive when she says yeah. it because she's talking to a human. Yeah. Um, but that is the Asari mindset. That is something they have to consider when they think about their partners. This person, I'm going to have to treasure for a long, for as much as I can while we're together. Mm. On the just 20 feet away from those guys, you can see an Asari talking to her adoptive father because she never knew her original father. But like her mother got together with this Asa with this Salarian, sorry, and they only lived for like 50 years, and he's approaching the end of his lifespan. And they both know that he's not going to be around much longer. So he's trying to get her something so that she remembers him. The daughter, who's not even his real kid, just his foster, uh, uh, stepdaughter, uh, yeah. remembers him when he's gone. Yeah. That, 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 that is incredible amount of thought put into this world of immortality and how... You need other people and the implications of loss versus long life. Yeah. You know what you could do, and this would be kind of simple, but just the first thing that came to my mind. If you're doing the uh, dealing with the possibility of loss, the inevitability of loss and so forth, and, and, and having to face that emotionally, you could have an immortality serum that makes you immortal, but like also tends to turn you crazy and evil, right? And there's, like, a whole deal of a devil thing in there. Mm -hmm. And at the end, she has to, like, give up on that, you know, because it's better to live genuinely for a short amount of time than to be corrupted and turn into not, someone you're not, you know? Oh, like in Stargate, how they had the sarcophagus? Uh, yeah, but I for, didn't see it most of that, so tell me how that works. Okay. Uh, Does it do just what I said? It makes you evil? <laughs> okay, the sarcophagus is a goa Uld device. The goa Uld are cranial parasites that pretend to be gods. One of the ways they do this is through the sarcophagus. It resembles, well, a sarcophagus. Naturally. Because the Go'uld were the inspiration for all the ancient Egyptian myths and a bunch of other myths. Or they co-opted them and chose to be like them. It's, it's confusing. It's not exactly clear in some cases. Anyways, the sarcophagus is capable of bringing you back from the dead. If you're recently dead. So, like, I can't oh, go dig up Beethoven. Beethoven. But it doesn't drive you crazy immediately. Over a prolonged period of time, it is addictive, and it drives you crazy. Okay. That's why the Goa Uld are so insane in the modern era. Why they're all, Worship me, for I am your god, mortals! It right, used to be that they yeah. didn't know that they thought, Oh, yeah, we're totally normal people. We just have advanced technology. Now they actually buy into their hype because the sarcophagus drives them insane right. as they use it. Kind of like all those Roman empires went insane because it turned out they had lead poisoning the whole time. Yeah, apparently lead is not a good cop material. No. Very bad. Yeah, or that Chinese emperor who, like, they found, they dug up and they found, oh, he was taking all these immortality serums made of mercury. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I heard something about that. Yeah, that wasn't smart of him. That was actually very stupid of him. That's why you need to test your immortality serums. We've been telling you this whole time, Chinese Emperor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Just get Chinese this message Emperor from the future. <laughs> who has a time traveling laptop and knows how to watch a <laughs> shitty internet review show. Woo! <laughs> that'd be, that'd be a very specific demographic. <laughs> that'd be our, our most famous viewer ever. <laughs> <laughs> you see, like, the zombie emperor, like, They mentioned me, guys! They mentioned me! He's, like, pointing in the terracotta soldiers and, like, standing over his shoulder, not moving because they're terracotta. <laughs> they mentioned me, guys! They watched me! Woo! Oh, history's weird. <laughs> yeah. I always wondered what would happen if, um, Henry VIII got to come back just to hear that Henry VIII song. 
I'm Henry the Eighth. I am, and he's like, he's like, this is my legacy. Seriously, you guys, <laughs> this one guy sings this one stupid song. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, 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 yeah. I would definitely start uh, rebuilding it around this concept of having learning how to deal with loss rather than taking a destructive path to avoid it or something. That could work. And then her getting together with Julius. What was the theme it, of this movie? The theme of this movie was steampunk stuff is happening. Woo! <laughs> and that was honestly, that was like the core of it. And I did enjoy it, but like, yeah, you're right. But we see all these problems all over the place. You'd think that the lizard's plan would be to fix these problems. Instead or somebody of, would have a plan to fix the problems. If the yeah, lizards the aren't lizards... going to do it, maybe the humans have an idea. Like, if humans, beings in general, are too warlike, wouldn't it be nice if our heroes, maybe during the plot, or even just during the epilogue, somehow make a stand for peace and, like, show that humanity can change we don't need to shoot each other all the time? If that was, like, a major theme, then that should have come up, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just... There, there, there wasn't a central theme to this film. That's, yeah, yeah. that's it. It's not, um, oh, you need to strive against adversity because that's the theme of every film. Yeah, it's a very generic sort of adversity, you know. Yeah, th that's why I say this is a popcorn flick. Yeah. Because it doesn't feel like there's a deeper something I know you to mean, it. I know you mean, yeah. I mean, it was good, it was enjoyable, it was amusing, but... Not deep, no. You could and they came to so many possible deep things. We talked about war, immortality... Loss, resource family, shortages. resource shortages, you know, for the planning aspect of that. A concept of a love story, which in theory can be done, you know, in a much greater depth. Oh, yeah, you know, when Guardians of the Galaxy had a better love story. That's right, thing. yeah. I'll, I'll Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy had a raccoon riding a tree while screaming and shooting a machine gun, and that was more realistic than this film. Yeah, that's actually that's actually a very good comparison because they both have a certain type of zaniness, not quite the same style, but you know, definitely like reveling in, in weirdness and, and strange new locations and technologies and stuff. But Guardians, and I'd say especially Guardians V two, uh, had a lot more character depth than this did. I must yes. admit, that's true. That's true. Exactly, and it's just. When the talking tree that says "I am Groot" over and over again has more character depth <laughs> than your main heroine, look, I'm not saying that April was a bad character. She just, just didn't she, didn't stand out as much as she nearly could have. Yeah, yeah. she did. Uh, why was she in the dress? Uh, top soldiers put it on. That's all there was to that. <laughs> okay, yeah, but um, why though? Which I uh, yeah. I did, by the way, uh, I liked this, the one little moment where Pop says, oh, there's something for you to change into. And you see later, he has an entire closet full of the same dress in different sizes because every time, like, another year goes by, he'd buy one slightly bigger in case he meets her this year. And it hinted at this idea that he, like, was really felt passionate about finding her again and this was a big deal for him. But I must admit, when he does actually see her, um he is kind of flat about that like he doesn't immediately rush in and hug her he's like oh what the an hour you're supposed to be here in an hour and yeah oh well and he sits down <laughs> he's old so i'm willing to buy him a little slack yeah. but you you are correct for the most part i'm willing to put it down to surprise shock and he's like 90 that's true that's true although that doesn't excuse the fact that his character was almost inexcusably bad in that he was very much a deus ex machina <laughs> Oh, this piece of technology? Of course I know how it works. Let me reach into my ass and pull <laughs> that out. Like, he takes an alien machine that no people have been trying to decipher for years and figures, huh, maybe if I plug this thing into this thing clearly marked for it. Yeah. And also, all of the scientists that have been kidnapped are totally cool with this, except April's dad. Like, nobody else was like, I don't really like working for those people. Also, I miss my extended family that hasn't heard from me in a decade. Also, uh, or just, if they're all altru so altruistic, they're like, yeah, we should help make life happen on other planets. Okay, how about helping the life that exists on this planet? That'd be nice. Yeah, I mean, no one, we hear none of these scientists go, hey, maybe we should try this thing, this Thing out in that Normandy area, which is apparently Fallout 4 land. Yeah. No, Fallout 3 land. Well, well, they didn't have a working serum, so in that case, it didn't matter. Oh, no, not serum. Um, 
How about we test out dropping these spores all over the place? Oh. You know, make some plants grow. No. Oh, filter yeah. the soot out of the atmosphere. Or how about we just invent oil to prevent the energy wars? Because the epilogue tells us that once oil is invented, like, the energy wars cease because there's plentiful energy around. Yeah, except we know from the real world that oil will run out. And that means that the wars will begin again in, like, a couple hundred right. years. I mean, I guess they invent better solar or something. But, um... But yeah, definitely, if you're going to tell us that getting oil fixed a lot of stuff, then did any of the scientists want to go fix a lot of stuff? I think it was I mean, kind of like, like, isn't it cool to see all these cool, famous people all in the same place? They're, look, there's Einstein. Look, there's like somebody else. Uh, but you didn't think of them as individual people so much as plot devices? <laughs> you didn't even think of them as plot devices. Yeah, I thought of them as characters. background characters. Yeah, you yeah. could have replaced them with generic person number 16, yeah. and it wouldn't have mattered. You could just say, oh, okay, this is this scientist. This is this scientist. Yeah, yeah. They could all be lizard scientists. So it would still work. Yeah, it would. Hmm. <sighs> like I said, it's a popcorn flick. It wants to be more, yeah, but it doesn't go the extra mile to you're be right. more. You're right. Honestly, on the second viewing, and with your help, I'm seeing the more of the flaws in it than I did the first time around. I mean, yeah, I did have J.K. Simmons playing a lizard monster in a power armor suit, so that was awesome, but it doesn't make up for the flaws. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, never it's got still those good, photos, but way. it's not good. It's, it's not, yeah. Uh, well, then... The thing to learn from this is how important it is to make sure your characters drive the plot and have the unique, uh, you know, struggles and, and developments and stuff as the plot progresses. Instead of getting distracted by all the shiny toys and how many, like, fun random things. Like, the house with r robot legs and stuff is like a shiny toy, writer-wise. It was cool to look at, and it's a neat idea, and... By the way, character development. Is that happening at some point vaguely? Uh, no, yeah. it's not. I mean, they, they I mean Julius kind of betrayed us, and then he was better. But that was pretty vague, you know? Yeah, they don't really... They go into, oh, yes, I, I'm i sorry. Oh, yeah, well, I'm still mad at you. And then we're going to wander through the jungle for a bit. And then they have the big action scene, and he helps out, and then she kisses him. And I was like, oh, I guess that's settled. Also, he says early on that he never knew his parents. I thought that we are going to get back to that. Like... You know, this idea of family and wanting to be reconnected and she can maybe find her mom and dad again, but he can never find his because he has no idea who they are. I think they did that a little bit because remember when they were in the elevator and he was looking away when she was celebrating that's with true. her parents? That's so true. So that's a little bit of that, but it wasn't... There's a lot more you could have done in theory. Agreed completely and totally. Mm. Hell, Bolin and Mako reacted better to this when, you know, they talked about their life on the streets in Korra. That's right, yeah. Mind you, they did find their uh, grandma and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking now of how this could have gone. If, if April has grown up in a hard life, I mean, she was on her own from the age of 10 or so, right? There's no talk of any other mentor. She must have been like a street urchin and maybe had a couple friends at some point. I mean, she has Darwin, but he's not exactly a mentor, just a friend. Um, he taught her. He taught her science. Some, some science, that's right. Well, okay. Um, but even so, she's living, you know, in a pretty hard scrabble existence. And you could imagine having conflicted emotions about your parents, especially towards her mom, when she finds that her mom is, uh, on board with the, the, you know, lizard plan. You know what would she make the say, plan like, better? But if it was actually decent, or at least there was some sort of... Like, we plan to populate all these other planets with spores. I'm like, okay. What's the moral problem with that? The moral problem with spores? What's the moral problem with seeding the planet? I mean, the lizards have been set up as this antagonistic force the entire movie. I mean, they should not be acting like or thinking like humans because they're not humans. You could argue mm. that that is part of their character is that they're unthinking, unknowingly replicating the mistakes of humanity, which was shown when they went into a civil war at the end of the film. But at the same time, thinking, if they think like humans, then put some more ambiguity in this plan. In Babylon okay. 5, there is an episode considered one of the cooler ones because it touches on the backstory of the series even though you could really remove it from continuity and nothing would really change. 
but it's called Death Walker, and they meet this woman, the last member of the Dilgar species known as Jadur, who's known as Death Walker, and she's basically what would happen if Dr. Mengele and Rommel had a baby. That's actually not an exaggeration. That is pretty much literally her character. And she spent the last 15-20 uh, years developing an immortality serum. And it works. But the thing is, she reveals that in order to make it, you need to kill someone else. The, there's something vital in another person that you need to take in order to make this immortality drug. And she's cackling as she leaves, saying, you will fall upon each other and cause more bloodshed and death than I ever could. The mountains of bodies will be tributes to my greatness. Wow. I mean, uh, she does it better, and she's obviously way more insane. And then I said to Brie poked a hole in that, like, could we use an animal? <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about clones? Yeah. Could we find someone who's just about to die anyway and get their permission? <laughs> yeah, see, I personally don't think that works because in Babylon 5, souls are an actual thing that they've proven to exist. Thus, the existence of the race known as the Soul Hunters. So I'm thinking it might have something to do with that. All right. But I don't think that's important at the moment. But they're actually... What my point is, is that Babylon 5 is fucking awesome and you should all be watching it. Ah. My other point is, with Jadur's plan, she's offering this information freely. This is how you make the serum for immortality. I'm actually going to some of the friendly governments... And I'm going to help them to set up assembly lines so that everyone can be immortal. But here's the catch. You have to kill other people to well, make yes, it happen. Yes, no, 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 that's, that's and, it. There is a, yeah. a catch, a reason to not take this immortality drug. There is a moral quandary here. Mind you, they settled it in the series by having uh, the, the Vorlons come in and blow up Jadur before she can reveal any of the secrets. And then the, the Vorlon ambassador saying, you guys are not ready for immortality. And then gliding away. Hmm. Although, interestingly enough, there's like an expansion in one of the side games uh, where everyone there's a huge free-for-all over the uh, escape pod with Jador in it. And then one of them takes it away and flees and then receives a message back and the ship that took her away is never seen again. You are really not ready for immortality. <laughs> but with Jador's immortality thing, there was a reason why you would both want it and not want it. With the lizards, it's there's no real reason why we wouldn't want to reseed these places. I mean, aside from the fact that it's absurdly, you know, high thinking, it, it violates the "help yourself before you help others" rule. Given that you are still on this planet that is rapidly running out of resources, but there's no real negative imperative to let them go with through with this plan. Yeah, it only has its evil twist at the end when Rodriguez is like, ah, I'm doing it the evil way. Yeah, and that wasn't really... Hmm. It was sort of manufacturing a conflict at the last minute. Exactly. It felt like Rodriguez's... They had it all set up up to this point and then realized, oh shit, we don't know. Yeah, uh, it's conflict. like, then, then everyone just peacefully allowed this to happen. Yeah, and and like, then they... Oh. So then they went back and added in a bunch of lines for Rodriguez. Uh, yeah. to allow him this thing of I'm actually evil and this is my evil plan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Babylon 5 example is much more interesting, I must admit. Well, Babylon 5 example makes anything better. <laughs> Yay. But uh, let's... So, in short, the characters weren't really great. The characters weren't really well developed. The villains weren't really well developed. The plot wasn't driven forward by the characters. Not in a thematically deep way, anyway. There yeah. wasn't really a theme. Popcorn flick. Yeah, I guess it was. <laughs> this was Transformers. No, no, no. Right. This is not as dumb as Transformers. Oh, come on. The 2007 one. That was the best one. Even so, I thought this was deeper than that. This was really. Yeah, I thought it was. I thought that one was deeper. I thought I don't know. Transformers was more just like. How do I say this? 
at least here I could go and look at like whoa interesting like cable car and stuff and there's like a world built around in the background and Transformers is just like shit is exploding and fighting and just the sheer chaos of combat nothing else even the little world building details are more interesting than Transformers yeah okay I'll give you that but at the same time the characters felt like people in Transformers more than they, they did I mean, here. They were, I mean, they I'm not were saying more they didn't feel like people, yeah. but I'm saying that the characters, like, you couldn't see them acting. Like, with Sam, I could. The last time I saw this was back before 2010. I just saw April's thing, and I couldn't really tell you something unique about April. Sam, I could tell you, like, at least three or four traits. He's curious, he's flawed, uh, a little on the horny side, but <laughs> desperate. Yeah, hmm. Well, I mean, April's got a scientific mind, and Law, they touched on this a little. I like the idea that she was a petty thief. I guess they didn't really come back to that and its moral implications and whatever. Uh, yeah, cares about her family, but we didn't get as much of that as there should be considering the plot i was gonna say earlier you could imagine this this tearful confrontation with her mom like why did you leave me in the streets for like 10 years and actually her... i wouldn't i wouldn't really have that because we saw why she was left in the streets because the fucking thing exploded well so she assumed april was dead is that the idea we're going with oh oh right Oh, if, okay. No, I see where you're going with this. Yeah. Especially since there's a passage out in the bathroom and they know about it. Yeah. Like, you, you couldn't walk out and go grab the kid and bring it back down there. Yeah. I mean, I guess they didn't know where she was, but I don't know. That's rather vague. Especially since she's literally upstairs. She's literally upstairs. It's not like they're on the other side of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow you didn't spot her in ten years, and you've got these rizzers. I mean, maybe the rats are a new thing or something. You could have done so much more with her. Yeah, you could have. I admit. So, so yeah. yes, a tale of how a story can potentially be made better. Think of these things in advance before you make the movie, and then you can fix them in the scripting process. Amen, brother. That's what we're for. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think we're done? Yep. Okay, anyways, I'm Sith King. And I'm Soxons. We're signing off.